So before I begin and introduce, uh, introduce Mel, um, just some acknowledgements that I'd like to, uh, like to point out for both financial and also logistical support. Uh, we've also received funding from the Brain and Mind Institute, the Department of Psychology, and the Robarts Research Institute. So I gratefully acknowledge uh, this, uh, this support. It's helped us get this event off the ground. Um, neuroscience has a diaspora here at Western. There's lots of different departments and faculties that have, uh, are, are conducting research. So uh, these departments and faculties have also helped us get the word out to, uh, to communicate this event as broadly as possible. Um, I am, uh, so when we initially uh, came up with this event, um, this was something that was actually recommended by um, the external review of neuroscience in London, and it's something that we've tried to get off the ground uh, for a couple of years. And again, it was in recognition of that sort of diaspora that I talked about. There's lots of different people conducting research, although this is event is kind of coming out of the neuroscience graduate program by, by no means is it limited to that. And um, this is one of the things that we identified as the sort of need for, for an additional sort of research day. Um, one of the things we kind of made unique about this is that this is really intended to be a by trainees for trainees event. So even though I'm up here, the PI droning on and on, I'm only one person of the organizing committee, and the, the rest of the organizing committee is graduate students in the Society for uh, Neuroscience graduate students. We'll talk about them in just a second. But two broad goals for this, uh, this event is one is to try to foster a sense of collaboration and community. Um, you know, I've had the experience many times that I have to go to a conference to interact with my colleagues, which I think is pretty ridiculous. We should get better at interacting with each other here, and the best way to do this, I think, personally, is to start it at the trainee level. So this is something that we're trying to, both through formal methods and informal methods, increase a sense of community and collaboration. So some of the informal methods, we're all invited to go over to the grad after uh, Mel's talk, so we'll have sort of a, a neurosocial after this event. Uh, we have some trainees coming down from McGill, their CFREF Healthy Brain for Healthy Lives. Um, this is sort of a partnership between the CFREF, so, so they'll be here. And we actually have a, a formal collaboration award that I'll talk about in, uh, in just a second. So that was one of kind of the broad goals. The other goal is to sort of start to enhance these career relevant skills. I mean, as PIs, we're training trainees to kind of be like us, but the reality is the majority of trainees are ending up outside of the academic university setting. So there's a career panel session that's gonna to speak directly to how some individuals have taken their neuroscience training um, outside of the university setting. And a lot of the things that are trying to be reinforced in modern graduate training, communication skills, project management, those apply to lots of different career options. So that's something that we're, uh, we're trying to uh, develop here too. And I see that there's two number ones there. All right. <laughs> um, Okay, so big thank yous to the organizing committee, the, uh, the members of SONGS, the executive of the Society for, of Neuroscience Graduate Students. So Naveen's been fantastic, Abdullah, Simon, Ariel, Joyla Farage, and Christina, working with them has been terrific. Uh, they did the bulk of the work in this. It's incredible to think that this is sort of the first one of these events that they've, uh, that they've, they've put together. Um, so a big thank you for that. Uh, we've also received help from the planning committee, some people at BrainScan, Maggie and Ryan, and then Susan Simpson, the administrator of the, the grad program, has, uh, has also helped a lot. So speaking briefly on the Collaborative Research Award, this is, one of, this is a new venture that we're trying here. We're again just trying to encourage the, the ideas of, uh, that, and the benefits of collaboration. So this is intended for trainees that have never collaborated before um, together, lab, coming from labs that have never worked together. Um, basically, there's a one-page form that you would have received it at the back of the program. There will be hard copies available tomorrow, and you just write down some ideas. The members of the organizing and planning committee will uh, review these, and there will be a cash award for what we think is the, the best sort of collaborative project, just the proposal that's coming out of it. So, so put some thought to that tonight, maybe discuss it over, uh, over a beer at the grad club, and uh, we, we're looking forward to seeing some, uh, some interesting ideas. So I think this brings me to Mel. So now we'll, we'll transition to the introduction for the public lecture. I'll get to kind of the traditional academic stuff in, uh, in just a second. But first what I'd really like to emphasize is sort of the history that Mel has had at Western here in 
highlighting some of the things and fostering some of the things that are so important for this research day itself. I mean, as a uh, by trainees, for trainees event, I think Mel's absolutely perfect for uh, this public lecture. Um, he was one of the members of the original steering committee that envisioned the development of a graduate program in neuroscience back in, uh, that started back in 1991. So we've been going for 27 or 28 years, and I think it's in large part to the vision that Mel and a number of others on campus had right back, uh, back in the 80s. Um, Mel also has a, an established history of leading group grants in which training has been an absolutely fundamental part of it. So Medical Research Council group grants, the CIHR group grants, this is going back to the old GAP group. Um, this has included people not only at Western, but also at York, and, and uh, I guess Laurier, at Queens. Um, he's just got this incredible skill to bring together uh, people to conduct collaborative research. Um, tra and sort of training grants, the, the CREAK grant he was uh, involved in. And then a lot of the equipment that we enjoy here at Western is in, is in large part due to the efforts that Mel and a number of others have led in, uh, in getting critical equipment on campus. Of course, he's the founding director of the Brain and Mind Institute and a member of uh, the team that obtained the Brain Scan grant. I think one of the things that I really like, I just heard that Mel has a new grandchild, so he's a, a real grandfather. Of course, he's an academic grandfather many, many, many times over. Uh, I, I looked on NeuroTree, so, and this is undoubtedly an undercount, 36 trainees on NeuroTree. They have their own trainees, so I didn't bother counting the number of academic grandchildren, but there are, I mean, I think about Mel to Jody to Jason Gallivan. Jason Gallivan now has trainees, so there's academic great-grandchildren out there as, as well. So Mel's had a tremendous impact on, uh, on training in cognitive neuroscience in, in Canada. So now sort of traditional, the, the sort of traditional academic uh, introduction. How do you know you've made it? Well, one of the ways you know you've made it is that you have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> so, so Mel has a Wikipedia page, and this hits on a lot of the highlights of his, uh, his career. He's a CRC here, uh, fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, fellow of the Royal Society, um, and just innumerable uh, high-impact publications, and of course the research that we'll hear about today. So on this Wikipedia page, there's this quote from his, uh, uh, I guess, the, uh, along with the, the fellowship of the Royal Society, this was the blurb saying, you know, he's one of the foremost visual neuroscientists, these ideas on the, uh, the, the pathways for vision and separate pathways for vision and action that we'll hear about. I think the last quote's the most important one, how uh, this account is now really part of every textbook in, in uh, on vision, cognitive neuroscience and psychology. So that's a, just a tremendous impact. How do you know you've made it part two? Well, you have some sort of impact in popular culture. So unbidden to me, just this, this book arrived on my desk from a publisher, Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? And I'm like, that's interesting. <laughs> so there was some quote in the, in the, uh, uh, on the book that you know the neuroscientists have sat beside or sat on the sidelines for far too long on uh, on the zombie the coming zombie apocalypse and you know we have to engage our efforts and sure enough there in chapter seven is the uh, is the the vision for action pathway the dorsal pathway and there in chapter eight is the vision for perception pathway the ventral stream so Mel's idea is represented in the popular press and popular culture so. With that, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Mel for his public lecture. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Let me uh, find my talk. Well, it's a great honor to <coughs> kick off the uh, inaugural event. Uh, it promises to be a very exciting day tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. You know, um, as uh, Brian said, I'm the founding director, or I'm the founding director of the Brain and Mind Institute, but I've, I've stepped down into it as now uh, the director. And of course, one thing that happens when you uh, step down as director is that you go back to teaching. And so I will be teaching, of course, uh, in uh, the winter of winter term of uh, 2020. Uh, it'll be, <clears throat> I think quite appropriately, the history of psychology, because I'm old enough to know most of the people involved. <laughs> <laughs> but it also made me think that perhaps that was a way for me to present my talk, uh, to give a kind of historical account of how I arrived at uh, the idea uh, of the two visual systems. So I'm going to take you back 
way, way back to the University of Calgary, uh, circa 1966, where I graduated um, with a master's degree. And I worked uh, in this lab. I worked uh, here in the Rod Cooper lab. Um, Rod Cooper, here he is. Um, and there are a number of other uh, luminaries, actually, who were all his graduate students. Uh, Lance Taylor, John Pinnell, Michael Peters, um, Brian Bland, Ian Wishaw. Uh, Michael Peters is now an emeritus professor at the University of Guelph. John Pinnell is an emeritus professor at UBC. Ian Wishaw is still working at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, and Brian Bland is chair of psychology at Calgary and is now an emeritus. Um, Lance uh, went into the prison system in Alberta, um, not as an inmate, uh, but as a, uh, as a forensic uh, psychologist. And I see, I, I checked him out online, he's still uh, giving talks uh, about, about such things. And that, uh, that cow use in the back uh, uh, is made beardless um, in, in Rod's lab, uh, I think around 1965. At any rate, Rod, um, Rod was a graduate student of Donald Heaven uh, at McGill. And he knew a number of people at Western who were also graduates uh, of Donald uh, Hebb's uh, tutelage. And uh, one of them also with Brenda Milner, both Hebb uh, and, uh, and Brenda. And so he packed us off, most of us there, uh, Michael Peters, uh, myself, uh, Ian Wishaw, Lance Taylor, Brian Bland. We all went off to Western as graduate students. And, um, Oh, but I want to point out one other thing. You see that right there on, on Rod's uh, hand? That is a cigarette. <laughs> um, those days, uh, we all smoked. Uh, I smoked, uh, and people smoked in the lab. That was just the way it was. It was a different world then. Um, and that was the first uh, uh, paper I published in 1965. And I think it uh, kind of <coughs> um, is, a, is a harbinger of what came later, because what I was looking at was the visual abilities of rats who had lost their posterior neocortex, that is their B1, area of B1, primary visual cortex, what they could still see, i.e. what they could still solve uh, in the discrimination task. Uh, nevertheless, um, um, you know, I published the paper, but I still wanted to go on to a PhD. And so I took a train, everybody took a train, nobody flew, it was too expensive, uh, from Calgary uh, to London, Ontario, uh, in the late summer of 66. And I got off the station there, the uh, CPR railway station in London, which some of you will recognize. Uh, it was the keg for many years uh, at, you know, at Richmond Street, just south of Oxford. Uh, it no longer uh, operates as a via rail to stop there anymore. And uh, <coughs> I, I went up uh, to the campus, to Middlesex, where psychology was uh, located. There was, it was a dry campus, there was no grad room. <laughs> and I eventually met all these people, sadly now past. Case Van der Wolf, Dorian Kamir, and Gordon Logginson, all of them uh, uh, who had chaired an office uh, at McGill uh, with Rod Cooper uh, with, um, under the supervision of Donald Hebb. And Dorian's case also in the middle. Um, they weren't particularly taken with me, so I ended up working uh, as a graduate student uh, with Andy Monjack, uh, who was, I think, two years older than me. He, was, he came uh, from uh, uh, Rob Doty's lab at Rochester, the Center for Revision Research. Uh, he never supervised a graduate student in his life. I'd never been supervised uh, in my PhD, so we worked together, and somehow he got me one. Uh, and uh, two years later, <coughs> he, he left Western, left uh, sort of Know, mainstream academic life, uh, and uh, got a PhD in public health from Johns Hopkins and ended up chief of the neurobiology of aging at NIH uh, and advised NASA uh, on the, um, the effects uh, of aging um, uh, on performance in space travel and, and vice versa. And during my PhD, I, I, I published again a paper that uh, looked at the relationship between visual cortex and these midbrain structures, the superior colliculus. Uh, so again, I was thinking, uh, I think about uh, how these higher order visual areas uh, intersect with what's going on uh, in the in, in the midbrain. I then went off to Oxford. <coughs> I won um, uh, an NRC, which is the um, uh, the progenitor of NSERC, uh, and um, I, I had a postdoc and. It was a magic moment for me at Oxford because uh, the salaries in Oxford were very depressed. The Canadian dollar was very strong. 
And so the only person who earned more than me was Larry Weisbrands, who was the chair of the department. Um, I worked with Larry uh, in, in days well before, five or six years before he invented or discovered the concept of blind sight in patients who uh, can still solve visual problems after they've lost primary visual cortex. And I also worked with his former graduate student, then a lecturer, uh, Alan Cowley, uh, at, uh, at Oxford for two wonderful years and had a great time. Um, at the end of that, in 1971, uh, you know, jobs had sort of dried up uh, uh, in Canada, and there was no internet. Uh, I was on the wrong side of the Atlantic, and it was really hard uh, to find a position. Uh, and so one day Larry came into the garden at the back of the uh, old building where psychology was uh, then housed before it moved to its brand spanking new building on Sulpox Road and asked me if I would like a job in Scotland. I knew nothing about Scotland. I knew nothing about uh, St. Andrews University where he said there was a position, but it was a job. Uh, so I took it, uh, taking a cut in pay uh, because I suddenly was earning less than I was as a postdoc. Uh, and ended up as a lecturer um, at a, a wonderful and, and very beautiful university, uh, University of St. Andrews, the oldest university uh, in Scotland, uh, founded uh, in the 15th century. Uh, used to be the capital at one point uh, during the uh, plague in Edinburgh. Um, and uh, I met this guy, David Milner. David Milner uh, in many ways changed my life. He'd, he'd been hired the year before. He'd come from George Ettinger's lab. And we became fast friends and um, longtime colleagues. We still work together. Um, uh, and he and I, as you'll see, um, developed uh, a new way of looking at the organization's visual pathways and cerebral cortex. But it was, it was a, for me, um, a memorable moment to have met David. And it, it changed my life, um, I, I think, forever. And while we were there, we worked together. Um, we, um, worked on the role of spirit folliculus in oriented behavior, and it was interesting. We, I got my first grant then. We got it together from the SRC, uh, the Science Research Council in, in the UK. But we got it conditionally. We had to go um, down to Oxford to talk to Larry about how to do research on the spirit folliculus, um, and so we dutifully packed up. Uh, our bags, went down to Oxford, had a nice lunch with Larry, who said, yeah, I think you guys have got it straight. And then he came back, and uh, we started on the grant. And it, it was very successful. We generated quite a few papers. But, you know, Canada called. And so in 1977, I came back to Canada. Uh, that's a, a view of uh, the campus in 1977. The next year, as some of you will remember, uh, some of the faculty members in the audience was the <coughs> centennial. Uh, of the founding of the University of Western Ontario. Um, so uh, I, I was there for that. Um, I didn't get a plate. Um, but I did um, uh, rekindle my relationship with Dorian Kamira. And I decided because I was, I was working on animals and I, and I persisted for some time working with rats, with pigeons, with gerbils. Um, I had one monkey experiment that I did uh, and published with, with uh, David Milner. But I was increasingly interested in working in human behavior and importing many of the ideas that I was forming about uh, the visual control of movement in animals into studies uh, of people. But to do that, in order to sort of pay back the neurologist to be able to sign a clinical report and so on, um, I became a clinical neuropsychologist under the supervision and eagle eye uh, of Doreen Kamira, uh, who videotaped or filmed, rather, my encounters uh, with uh, patients, not routinely, but occasionally, and then would sort of tear me to shreds over the way I was getting the waste and so on. But um, I eventually learned uh, how to uh, do such testing and became, uh, for, for many years, <coughs> a paid up member of the uh, Ontario Board of uh, Psychology. And another interesting fact, at that time I began working with patients, um, and I, my first graduate student, John Fisk, and I um, studied patients with progressive supranuclear super palsy, PSP. It's very important to study them because they often get confused with Parkinson's patients and it can be devastating for both them uh, and, the, um, and the family uh, because it's a death sentence when you get PSP. So we were looking at ways of trying to see by using eye movements whether we could actually distinguish between Parkinson's and PSP. And I'll get you to note this, that uh, the author, the senior author on that paper was Barney, was Henry Barnett. That was my first paper was with, uh, with Barney, with Henry Barnett, who 
along um, uh, with um, Charlie Drake, uh, founded the Ro Robarts Research Institute. So that was, uh, and Barney was great. Um, he arranged for all sorts of patients, and uh, he was he was terrific. He um, read read our uh, initial drafts and was a wonderful <coughs> wonderful person to work with. Okay, so uh, the year after that, um, I married uh, John Finnegan, uh, who's also a faculty member here at Western, and um, we decided to take the whole year off. You could do it then. I took the whole year off, <laughs> and um, I'm in a sabbatical, and I bought a round-the-world ticket. Uh, we bought round-the-world tickets, the two of us, and we circumnavigated the whole globe. And you can travel on at that time on any airline. It was a Star Alliance or One World. You could transfer to any airline. And we went from I don't know L.A., uh, Tahiti, uh, Cook Islands, Fiji, New Zealand. Stayed in Australia for uh, four months. Went all through Asia, India for a month. Egypt, Greece, Hungary, met Yuri Buzaki there, um, and ended up in France, um, in Lyon, uh, at a, an, a, an insem there. And I worked with these two gentlemen, uh, Claude Prevalon and Marc Genereau, and I learned how to measure in detail uh, things like reaching and grasping uh, in humans by attaching um, infrared light emitting diodes and tracking the behavior. I, I, I learned it all from Mark and from Claude. And we, uh, it, was a, it was a productive four months. Uh, we got a nature paper out of it. And uh, what we showed in that paper is very important. I'll just, I'll just give the, uh, the bottom line of the discussion here. And it kind of uh, foreshadowed uh, what David and I later developed. Uh, but we were looking at it in normal individuals. The neural mechanisms mediating the perception of target position can be dissociated from those mediating visually guided reaching movements directed at that target. So that people might not see, for example, a jumping target, but they can correct. If the jump occurred during a saccade, for example, they wouldn't see a jump, but they would nevertheless correct at the end of the saccade. So that really suggested that maybe things were going on uh, where perhaps everything that we see is not what's necessarily guiding our behavior. David and I, as I said, continued uh, our collaboration. And um, we published, and I'll get to the details soon, um, an article in Trends in Neurosciences uh, in 1992 in which we laid out the idea that there are different pathways that have different functions in the cerebral cortex of the primate brain that are responsible for very different classes of visually driven behavior. So, what do we mean when we say that there are separate pathways for, in this case, perception and action? And so with that uh, kind of background, I now want to sort of explain to you um, our ideas uh, and the evidence for those ideas. So, in order to do that, I have to step back because I think this is what most people on the street uh, think vision does. It sort of paints a picture, you know, of the world outside, a kind of you know, simulacrum, if you, if you will, for the real, of the real thing that we can use uh, to guide our behavior and walk around obstacles and recognize people and, uh, and things that, uh, um, uh, that, that are important to us. But of course, as philosophers will tell you, or anyone who thinks about it very hard, uh, there can't be a picture in our head because that sort of raises the question, who's looking at the picture in our head? And it becomes a reductio ad absurdum problem. That's not to deny that we have a psychological representation of the world. I mean, I do see you up there. And um, I, I see where, where we are and where I'm standing and my relationship, um, spatial relationship with you. But even so, I would argue, and what David and I did argue, was that that is not how vision began. It didn't begin as something for seeing the world. It began as a system, really, for controlling movement. It was a kind of distal sensory system for controlling movement. This is a kind of reductio ad absurdum example. It's the euglena, as you know. The euglena lives in ponds, and when it's in a dark part of the pond, it moves its flagellum a lot. And when it's in a sunny part of the pond, it doesn't move its flagellum very much. And so as a consequence, it stays in a part of the pond where there's sunlight, which is important. It's a resource because, of course, it has chloroplasts. 
and it um, actually you know, manufactures, uh, makes energy uh, from sunlight and uses that to uh, move around the world and, um, uh, and catch uh, and, and filter feed and, and so on. Now, nobody would argue, I think, maybe some of you would, but I, I certainly wouldn't, that the euglena sees the world, that it has somewhere in that uh, cytoplasm uh, some kind of coding uh, of the world uh, beyond uh, its membrane. It does, you don't have to talk that way. You can talk instead entirely mechanical terms. Uh, you, you can talk about light striking uh, a photochemical, which produces changes in microtubules, which moves the flagellum or not. That's all you have to do, all you have to say. So the question arises, can you talk about at least some aspects of vision in vertebrates in exactly the same way? Do you have to always invoke this idea of perceiving things in order to imagine the control of Well, some very elegant work that influenced me enormously by uh, David Engel that was published in Science that was called Two Visual Systems in the Frog really uh, spoke to that issue. What he showed was that there were independent pathways from the retina to motor neurons for different classes of visual motor behavior. So some pass through the superior collicula, some pass through the pretectum, and that these did different things. And you could rewire one and not the other, and you could get an animal that was wired up back to front in terms of prey catching, but was really good at avoiding barriers. Never made a mistake. So, you know, that suggests that vision evolved not as a single system that allows organisms to see the world, but as an expanding collection, fairly independent visual motor modules. They have to be coordinated, obviously, but they can be, at some level, quite independent. And I, I, I was thinking of, about that long ago when uh, I, I wrote an invited chapter uh, in Terry Robinson's book, Behavioral Approaches to Brain Research. Well, what about us? You know, are, are pathways organized <coughs> excuse me, the same way? Well, you know, you just have to look, I think, right from the get-go, the projections from the eye to the brain. Because it depends what kind of anatomist you are, you know, whether you're a lumper or a splitter. But there's somewhere between 10 to 14 different sites where the retina projects in a first synapse. So there are projections, as you know, to the suprachiasmatic nucleus that help uh, synchronize uh, the circadian rhythms with uh, the local um, uh, light dark cycle. Um, there are uh, pathways that go to the accessory optic tract. There are three sets of nuclei that are important for the visual control of the posture and the pitch roll and yaw uh, of the whole visual array that drives these uh, three independent uh, nuclei are, are quite uh, consistent with the semicircular canals in the vestibular system. There are projections uh, to the pretectum, to the ventral LGN, to the pulvinar. We don't know a lot about what they do. What we do know, at least in animals, is that the pretectal uh, pathways are important for the visual control of locomotion and barrier avoidance. And of course, we know there are projections to the sphere colliculus. Uh, Brian studies it. He can tell us that uh, the colliculus plays an incredibly central role uh, in the control of saccades and, and the control of fixation and so on. And, um, of course, uh, the most heavily studied system is the one that projects from the eye to the thalamus, to the LGN, as uh, the dorsal part, and from thence to V1, and from thence, as we'll see, uh, to a set of pathways that make up what anatomists call the dorsal stream, and a set of pathways that project down uh, to what anatomists call the ventral stream. And what uh, um, I think is important to remember is that all of those pathways can operate by modulating these low-level networks uh, that we see in frogs and other vertebrates. But nevertheless, perceptual representations did emerge. That is, as animals became more social, as their lives became more complicated, they had to communicate with one another. Uh, they had to make decisions. Uh, they had to choose amongst goals. Uh, they had to think about the future in terms of visual representations. What might, what might they do uh, with the objects in that visual representation? <coughs> and so 
systems for representing the world emerged in the brain. But these uh, sort of general purpose representations, um, they really did confer a huge advantage because they allowed, as I just said, people and other animals to choose goals and think about uh, where they might go with those goals and, and to choose a course of action and communicate uh, with that uh, with other members of their species. But what's, I think, critical here is that those representations do not have any direct contact with the motor system. They instead work through a lot of cognitive buffers. There's a lot of cognition behind that that helps them choose between these goals and to plan courses of action. And you know, in, in primates, and certainly in, in our ancestors, there was at the same time increasing emphasis uh, on the generation of skill movements where uh, simple reflexive movements from the eye to motor uh, nuclei was not enough. You had to modulate them uh, in complex ways. <clears throat> so David and I suggested that there was evolutionary pressure for the emergence of two kinds of visual system in the cerebral cortex. One that allows you out there to recognize the objects uh, shown on the screen here, uh, the cup, the, the pen, the wristwatch, the hand, and so on. It's not real. And there's another system that allows the actor in the picture to reach out and pick up the cup. And what's interesting is that what David and I suggest, and I'll get to the evidence, is that fundamentally different transformations are involved and very different uh, neural pathways are engaged when you are acting on the world versus simply perceiving the world. And you can map this distinction between these two visual systems onto the two prominent pathways that I mentioned that arise in early visual cortex, one that projects up into the posterior parietal cortex, uh, which is important for transforming visual information into the required coordinates for action. Uh, it's beautifully poised to do that because uh, it's uh, in intimate contact with uh, somatosensory cortex. It has reciprocal, complex reciprocal connections with premotor cortex. It projects down to the brain stem. So it's in a position uh, to actually uh, integrate all that visual information with other information that's required in order to act on the world and to modulate, as I suggested, some of these basic uh, uh, sensory motor systems uh, in, the, in the brain stem. <clears throat> but there's another pathway that doesn't project down to the brain stem, that projects instead uh, to the medial temporal cortex, uh, to the ventral uh, frontal cortex, uh, that's important for representing the world, for perceiving the world, a perception, um, a system that delivers up uh, our percepts of the world, uh, and as I've suggested through the anatomy, is an intimate contact with things like the hippocampus and the amygdala and so on, important for uh, social behavior, whether it be visually driven social behavior, whether it be uh, visual memories and so on, uh, that are important for our cognitive life. Now, now, that didn't just come out of thin air, that idea. That, the Rosetta Stone for us, for unpacking it, uh, was this individual here known as uh, patient BF. And when we met her uh, in, well, when David met her in 1989, she was living in Italy, um, she had uh, developed hypoxia from carbon monoxide poisoning. She was taking a shower in a new, newly uh, renovated uh, cottage uh, in which the water heater was improperly vented. Carbon monoxide, which is a silent matter, it's, uh, it doesn't have an odor, uh, it, it, it's heavier than air, and so it stays in the room, then it basically um, uh, it, it displaces uh, oxygen from hemoglobin mo uh, molecules, so you have what's called uh, high anoxia or hypoxia. And so your brain gets starved of oxygen, uh, and, and you die. But eventually, um, eventually you die. Fortunately, uh, she, was, she was found by her husband before that happened, rushed to the hospital in a coma. And um, when they scanned her brain sometime later, they discovered that she had uh, you know, enlarged sulci, uh, which is common in patients, uh, in indicating degeneration. She had two extremely damaged here in the ventral stream in the lateral occipital cortex, uh, symmetrically on the left and right hemisphere. And a slight bit of damage also in the dorsal stream, which I'll talk about later. All right, um, when she came out of her coma, uh, the most salient symptom she had uh, as her vision began to recover 
was visual form agnosia. That is, she could not recognize objects on the basis of their form. She could recognize colors and texture of objects. She could tell whether something was made out of wood or plastic, but she couldn't tell its shape. Her clinical and psychophysical testing was essentially in the normal range. So when you tested her uh, acuity or contrast sensitivity and so on, she was fine, but she just couldn't see the shape of objects. Here she is in the backyard catching a ball. This is taken from the vault. This is a film made, a film, a, a, a VHS tape that I converted, um, it was made in 1990. Look at her, she's catching the ball. She can't tell the difference between a sphere and a cube. Uh, two years. Okay, so how does she do this in two years as well? How does she do uh, when you test her on conventional testing? How does she see the world? Well, if you give her these line drawings, um, where the only route to understanding what they are is uh, shape, uh, she can't tell one from the other. She can't tell anything. She can't recognize those objects. And it's not because she's somehow got a disconnection between semantics or language and the visual world, because if you ask her to copy them, those are her copies. So she doesn't see the world properly. But notice that she's not that she's blind, because she puts those little dots that somehow represent the text in the open book there, but it's not a well-organized drawing, and she doesn't know what it is. Now, if on another day, you ask her, you know, draw an apple, draw me an open book, Draw me a sailboat. These are the drawings that she produces. So she knows about objects somehow. She knows about some objects because, of course, she can touch them. And she continued to do so after accident. But she also knows because <coughs> she remembers what they look like from the past. Now, if you show her those drawings later, uh, she can't tell them one from the other any more than she can tell those you know, drawings on the, on the web. And of course, she's kind of drawing with her eyes closed, metaphorically, because sometimes when she starts a drawing, takes a pencil away and puts it down, it's in the wrong place, but she continues to draw, and so the, the drawing's disjointed. So if you show her this, you know, this Walmart special, she says, oh, it's made out of metal. It's an aluminium, she says. It's got red plastic on it. Aluminium, that's the perverse way that the English say aluminum. She was in she's English. <laughs> Um, she makes an educated guess. Is, is it some kind of kitchen utensil? Because she can see the aluminum, she can see the plastic, but she can't see the shape. You show her this, which is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, object scoop. Um, it's not funny for her, it's a tiger. I mean, she doesn't see the shape of the rabbit. Her deficit is so profound that if you hold up a pencil in front of her, you hold it vertically or horizontally on a slant and ask her to tell you, what, how, how, how am I holding it? She's no idea. She can say it's yellow. She might even guess it's a pencil because pencils have a kind of yellow, sort of glossy color, many pencils. But one day, um, she said, let me see that. And she reached out, and lo and behold, her hand was oriented in the correct orientation even though she couldn't tell you the orientation of the pencil. So somehow, the visual motor mechanisms in her brain that controlled her hand could react to that orientation even though she did not perceive that orientation. Now, you know, the editors of Nature and uh, other journals you know, don't go with those little anecdotes, so you have to do some real testing. And so we did. Um, we worked uh, up this slot task, uh, borrowed from um, from Kuypers uh, from the University of Rotterdam, who used it to test parietal uh, lesion monkeys. <coughs> and it's a slot, and it could be rotated in different orientations. And we simply asked DF to do one of two things. She either had to match the card in her hand to the, what she saw there, it's a perceptual task, and I think it's like this. Or she simply had to mail the card, post the card into the slot, like she were mailing a letter. Now, I've, again, I've gone back uh, to the VHS tapes. This is her matching. What you'll see here, I uh, hope you can see it, is that uh, uh, the person doing the testing is rotating it now in you know, different ways and so on and now. So 
says, tell me what the orientation is. Oop, not that. Maybe. Another trial. Match. Oops, nine degrees wrong. This happens all the time. She cannot tell you with that handheld card what the orientation of the slot is in front of her. Now you change the task, you say, look, I know you can't see the orientation of the slot, you know, humor me. I want you to reach out and post the card into the slot. It's a slightly different camera angle, but it's exactly the same setup. Now she's posting. Okay, away she goes. Boom. Notice she gets it right from the get-go. Her hand begins to rotate even before she's made contact. So she's not just sort of getting up there and sort of feeling for the edges of the slot. And it goes on like that. She gets it right every time. Okay. So you can accumulate that. Uh, you can uh, rotate the um, correct orientation, normalize the correct orientation to vertical. And that's the distribution of her matches. Uh, she's terrible. Uh, when you do the same thing with posting, my goodness, she's very good indeed. So, this is wonderful to associate. Neuropsychologists love this. It's a double dissociation. You have damage in one area. Well, it's not quite a double dissociation. I'll get there in a minute. It's a dissociation between perception and action, where you have a lesion in this place, and you can affect uh, uh, perception, but not uh, action. But you can ask the question, what about patients who don't, like, do you have lesions in the ventral stream, but have it instead in the dorsal stream? Well, as it happened, around the same time, a retraced parent and neurologist in Lyon, who I knew, and Alain Leghetto, were studying a series of optic attacks of patients. And they weren't doing a card matching tasks, but what they were doing <coughs> is asking the patients to describe the orientation. Was it vertical, horizontal, on a slant? Uh, and they can do that. They had no problem telling you what the orientation was. But when they tried to put their hand into the slot, they were terrible. Uh, they would come at it at the wrong angle, and they only were able to get their hand in when they felt it. And then they would be able to stick their hand into the slot. So, yes, it's a double dissociation. So these and <coughs> other studies of patients with lesions of uh, the two streams show that actions can remain sensitive to optic features that are essentially invisible to perception, or vice versa. And in fact, if you go in the literature before that, you can see the examples of this in clinical reports. I want to say uh, <coughs> something you can ask me about this later. And that is that the selective damage to LO and visual form agnosia, 95% of the cases in the literature from the mid-19th century are carbon monoxide poisoning something about carbon monoxide, and there are some speculations about why, which we can talk about, as to why uh, this damages areas like LO and other areas survive. Campion, for example, in 1987 reports a patient, RC, showed a profound visual form agnosia after carbon monoxide poisoning, could negotiate obstacles in the room, reach out to shake hands and manipulate objects or pick up a cup of coffee. Why didn't he put that together? I mean, these clinical reports are full of these descriptions where there's clearly a dissociation about what the person can do in everyday life and what they can do when you show them a picture of an apple. They can't tell you what it is. Or even recognize an apple on the table unless the apple has a particular color that identifies it as an apple. So, neurological patients uh, have told us a lot uh, about the dorsal and ventral streams. Uh, single unit recording in the monkey, beautiful work uh, uh, from Hideo Sakata's lab in Japan, uh, uh, Richard Anderson uh, in Caltech and others have shown uh, this association. Uh, and also, more controversially, visual motor psychophysics in normal individuals shows a dissociation between uh, the effects uh, of a visual illusion on your perceptual judgments uh, about the uh, versus the effects <coughs> of the illusion when you reach out uh, and pick up uh, the object that's embedded in the illusion, where the grasp is resistant to the illusion, even though you see the illusion. And also in um, fMRI, of course. Now, uh, fMRI, interestingly, um, we had never heard of 
um, when we were testing DF because it hadn't actually been invented. Um, I did a, a, a Boolean search. I gave up uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, of PubMed, putting in words like fMRI, functional magnetic uh, imaging, and so on. And what you can see is that it, it rose up quickly from two papers that were published in uh, 1992. And of course, uh, as we know, the author on both those papers, along with Sergio Gala, who's the senior author, was our own Radhi Menem, um, who uh, we fortunately scooped uh, from the University of Minnesota, and we uh, set up a 4T and stole a march on almost everybody else, uh, because we were one of four 4Ts uh, in the whole world at that time in 1995. But you know, we were testing DF back then, and uh, we knew nothing. Uh, about the uh, organization of her brain as measured by uh, fMRI. But um, in the late 90s, um, uh, I persuaded a, a very bright uh, postdoc, Jody Cullum, uh, to come to my lab uh, from Harvard, where she worked uh, with Patrick Kavanaugh, and she came. And she's still here, she's a <laughs> professor. Um, and she, uh, in the um, early 2000s, along with Tom James, who was my graduate student, who's now a full professor at Indiana University. Um, we brought DF to Canada, and we tested her in the old 4T. And what I'm showing you here, first of all, is not fMRI. Um, well, it is fMRI. Uh, it's the, but not in DF, as you'll see. This is the activation that you see in a normal observer's brain when you contrast, as a simple contrast, Intact objects with scrambled versions of those objects when there's no color or any surface texture to indicate uh, what the object is. You get this activation uh, in uh, area LO. Um, and this is DS brain. Uh, it's not activation, that's a lesion. Gosh, no surprise. She's got a lesion in the very place that allows, uh, that's activated um, when individuals uh, who have intact brains uh, are looking at. An uh, at pictures versus scrambled versions of those pictures. If you take a slice through DF's brain and you look at it, you can see, I think you can see, missing tissue there in LO on both sides, in the left and the right hemisphere. And of course, her, you know, other um, uh, shrinkage uh, of, of her cortex as well, but real missing tissue there in LO. Now, of course, the, you know, the important thing uh, is to sh see what happens when you show DF and DF's brain uh, in tack line drawings versus scrambled uh, drawings. And you contrast them. Well, the answer is not much happens. You don't get any differential activation mm -hmm. in her brain as you do in normal individuals. Because, of course, she can't tell them apart and she's missing the area. It's actually damaged uh, where this kind of, of, of um, unpacking of what it all means presumably takes place. And if you take the activation that you see in a normal observer and you actually morph it and put it under her brain, what you can see is that it falls in or nearby uh, those lesions in the S brain. So, you know, um, that, that's very nice. It, it, it sort of uh, shows that, uh, shows a good reason why she has such difficulty recognizing uh, objects on the basis of their form. But of course, what about visual motor control? where this is relatively intact in the DF. Of course, we know work from uh, old work from our lab and from many labs has shown <coughs> that in the dorsal stream there are these different visual motor modules that are important for, for grasping, for saccades, for, for reaching. Many of these areas have been discovered um, and, and many things have uh, happened to elaborate on what they might do uh, in Jody's lab. And uh, particularly with respect to grasping, and that's because Jody devised uh, something rather heroic, uh, which is a kind of grasp apparatus, as we affectionately call it, um, which is a way of testing grasping action in the magnet. It's not easy because, of course, you're moving, and so you have to develop uh, you know, slow ventilator designs. Uh, you have to uh, worry about uh, head slippage. You have to worry <coughs> about the fact that the arm is paramagnetic. All kinds of things you have to worry about, uh, but. Um, it was solved. Um, it was solved fairly early on, I would say. It's been elaborated upon since. Um, and when you test DF in the magnet with grasping versus reaching, uh, where 
grasping is reaching out and uh, grabbing one of those objects on the grass apparatus, which is driven, I might add, by uh, pneumatic uh, pressure rather than uh, solenoids because they won't work in the magnet. So engineers love building it. Uh, and you can back illuminate these objects and present, present a fairly unique uh, trial set. So you have to analyze it, reach out and grasp it, versus just reaching, where you reach out and touch it with the back of your hand. And if you do a contrast, what you see is activation in this area, the human AIP, um, it's called the human AIP because it was first discovered in monkeys, um, just called AIP in monkeys, but the human AIP, where you get activation for grasping being higher than the activation you see for reaching. What's interesting is you get no differential activation in LO, even though, of course, they see the object on both those trials, but they see it for reaching and they see it for grasping, but that seeing it is not what's driving the grasping response. The grasping is uh, the computations are done in situ uh, in the posterior parietal cortex in the dorsal screen. So what happens when DF grasps objects uh, in the magnet? Well, uh, what happens, uh, first of all, uh, we have to sort of pay attention to this little lesion uh, I, I, I pointed out earlier. And of course, it's got worse over time. So um, a very important study by Holly Bridge and David Milner, uh, who looked again at the S brain, has shown that there's thinning of cortex in the very posterior part of IPS away from AIP. And you can see it traced out here by some experienced uh, radiologists. Um, and so, you know, it was, the question was really whether or not this would prevent uh, any activation in AIP uh, because it was, uh, these, these lesions are posterior to AIP. And the answer is, it doesn't. So we see, uh, this is work by Jody, you see activation in AIP, in DF, when she grasps versus uh, reaches towards objects despite that damage in the more posterior regions of the IPS. So, these fMRI studies then are really entirely consistent with what we had observed in the neuropsychological testing so many years ago, which is a comfort to neuropsychologists uh, and perhaps a worry for people doing fMRI. Well, not so much now because we can do so much more. But there's also evidence of, of dissociations between perceptual report and the visual control of action in normal observers, even you and I control these dissociations if we arrange things correctly. And I had the privilege of working uh, with one of the, the great uh, visual perceptionists of the 20th century, Richard Gregory, uh, who came to London and spent a month here working uh, in our lab. <coughs> and we worked with something that he's very interested in called the hollow face illusion. You see this mask of Charlie Chaplin. It's turning around. That's the back of the mask. And oh my goodness, <laughs> it looks like it's sticking out even though it's not, it's hollow. It's called the hollow face illusion. And it's because the pictorial things that make up a face are so overlearned and wired in our brains that they somehow overcome the sort of other things like urgence and accommodation and so on that allow us to see a concavity instead forced to see the face. <laughs> so what you can do then is you can make an illusion, a hollow face illusion, as we did, where uh, you have a face, uh, normal face sticking out, and uh, the hollow face you can see there um, on a different part of the apparatus that can be rotated, and you stick these little magnetic targets on the face, uh, because as you'll see, we ask people to flick off those targets. It's an action. You just flick off the target only one target presented at a time. But as you notice, there are different depths. One's on the cheek, one's on the forehead. And that's what it looks like on the hollow face. And so um, we did perceptual estimates. What they did was on a piece of paper uh, that represented this line here, they wrote uh, a dot where they saw the target, whether it was on the cheek or on the, um, uh, on the forehead. And uh, we looked at those measurements to see whether or not they were doing them inside or outside on the hollow face or in the correct position of the normal face. Uh, the flicking task, uh, what happened was that we presented the target, they reached out uh, to flick it off and the lights went right off so they couldn't see their hand going 
inside, and we measure with a ham weight. And what you find is something really quite striking. When they're doing the conceptual task, this is the normal face, and of course the normal face, the forehead one is closer, and so they stick it, uh, make a mark on the paper that's further out, and similarly, uh, the cheek is closer, so they make the marks here on average, and they do exactly the same for the hollow face, even though, of course, they should be going back here, but in fact, they see it as sticking out, so they behave with the hollow face just as they do with the normal face. But when they flick it off, now they get it right. So they go inside to flick off the little target, even though they see the hollow face as though it was sticking out. And of course, they do as they should on the normal face. So this really suggests that the visual motor system can use bottom-up input about the real location of targets, despite the presence of this very strong top-down illusion about the face. So, <coughs> I hope uh, that's convinced you. Uh, there's a lot of other evidence, but I haven't time to delve into it. That um, there is a system in the dorsal stream that's important for control of action, and another uh, in the ventral stream, uh, in the civil temple area, it's important for perception. But you know, you know, that really does raise an important question. Why the hell do we need two visual systems? Why couldn't you have one general purpose visual system that does the job for both seeing the world and for reacting to the world? Uh, acting. Well, I think the answer, as we'll discover later, lies here. <laughs> You laugh because you recognize it as a glass of beer, even though it's a photograph of a glass of beer. And if you're in the picture and you stepped away, you'd still recognize it as a glass of beer. And if you sort of, you know, scrunch down and look at it, still look like a glass of beer. You lean forward, still look like a glass of beer. And if tonight you have too many uh, glasses of beer, that's the last thing you'll see, a glass of beer. So, this is a very old uh, point that I'm making, an old psychologist's point about object constancy. That what you see is not the geometrical projection on your retina, but what the object is. And artists have to be trained to somehow extract that geometrical representation in order to represent the object. And those of you who've looked at kids' drawings know they don't do that. They just draw a sort of standard view of a glass or a house. They don't show the way in which, uh, what, you know, under the age of five, the way it should uh, really be projected. It takes training. Now, all that's great for perception, but if you have to pick up the glass from here, it's really very useless. You, you, you can't use just a general representation of a uh, beer glass in order to pick it up. You have to know the exact location of the glass with respect to your hand, you have to know the size of the opening, you have to know the orientation of the handle, and you do that just in time, as it were, just in time computation, you get your hand uh, on the handle of the beer glass. And so, really what uh, I think the two visual systems are doing is that they are, they have different functions in the sense that what they, um, their functions are defined by whoever is going to use the information, by the consumers. The motor system needs very particular kinds of information, and the cognitive systems need another kind of information. And so very different kinds of computations are carried out for those consumers. So the visual information used by the dorsal stream for programming and for online control of those uh, actions, according to our model, at any rate, is not perceptual in nature. It can't be accessed consciously. You can't get at the visual information that's controlling your hand. It's unavailable. In other words, although we may be conscious of the actions we perform, we can't uh, extract the visual information that's used to program and control those actions. We can't experience that. So here's a, a kind of crude drawing of what I'm trying to say. So we have shared and distinct, uh, everything over to the left is in the gray is um, inaccessible to consciousness, and everything in the white is accessible. So we've got all these shared and distinct visual inputs, and some of them go up to the dorsal stream where the visual motor computations are carried out. Others go down uh, to the ventral stream where perceptual computations are carried out. You can't get access to either. That is, you don't know what the things are that make up your percept. You can't individuate that either. 
in the same way, you can't access the stuff that you know, actually uh, contributes to the vision motor computation. And what happens is that you can have a conscious percept, you can see the cup, or you might not, even though you still, it's still there, you can show it influences your behavior late, later. There's a lot of masking studies, priming studies that show the things that we don't see can influence our behavior later. So you can be conscious or unconscious of percepts. And similarly, you can be conscious or unconscious of actions. You can be conscious that you're picking up a cup, but not about the visual information that you're using, or you can be unconscious. You can be talking to somebody and just picking up the cup and drinking cup. So Larry, my old postdoc supervisor at Oxford who uh, named uh, Blind Sight, he loved puns. He once wrote a chapter called Blind Sight in Hindsight. <laughs> Larry um, once characterized dorsal stream vision, you know, in, in, in a normal individual without, a, without brain damage. In a sense, blind sight without blindness, because we're doing all this visual processing, but we have no access. It's what happens in blind sight when people have damage to the main contributor uh, to uh, the ventral stream. So it's a kind of metaphor, if you like, from engineering uh, that one can use to illustrate what I'm trying to say. Human beings have sent robots to Mars. We have robots there. They are not autonomous. We don't have autonomous robots on Mars. The, uh, the geeks at JPL that program those robots um, just don't have the code yet. Uh, robots are not that sophisticated. You know, they can, they can do all kinds of coding, but if it were autonomous and the robot met a Martian, I think the game is over. I don't know what the robot would do. It wouldn't know how to, code would not be sufficiently sophisticated for the robot to interact with that alien. Now, you could have what's called teleoperation. So, you know, the, the person down in Houston, the human operator, could drive the robot, like you would drive a robot into a, a house on fire, or into a, a lockdown house, or uh, into a volcano. And we do that. But there, um, we have very good understanding of what's going on. We, can, we know about houses and volcanoes, and we know about mine shafts. We have all kinds of cues that we're familiar with. We have instant uh, contact with the robot. We can use teleoperation. That's not going to work with a slave robot on Mars. We can't do that. We can't drive a robot on Mars because, first of all, there's many seconds that go by in transmitting the information to Mars. And second, we don't even know what we're looking at. So we can't really get a good sense of scale of what's going on uh, on the surface of Mars to, to really put things in perspective through the video cams and the mounting uh, on the robot. So instead, we use teleassistance or supervised control, uh, which engineers know a lot about, um, where you have a semi-autonomous robot where the human operator looks at the surface of Mars through the video cams that are on the robot and um, looks at, sees something kind of interesting, flags it in some way, and then communicates symbolically with the semi-autonomous robot and gives it instruction go over and sample that rock. And the robot then gets some coordinates provided by, uh, the, by, by the human operator uh, on the video cams and then can put it together and can then use its onboard range finders and every obstacle avoidance stuff and get to the robot or to the stone and do the in the posterior product cortex. Now, when the JPL engineers are getting sufficiently sophisticated, my bet is they will build their robots this way. Because it's, in other words, to have a system that does the just-in-time computations for action, another system that sort of has a rich representation of the world to make decisions that are useful and so on. Okay, um, one final little bit and then I'm done. I hope I'm uh, okay. So, I don't want to somehow leave you uh, with the thought that the ventral stream doesn't do anything for the control of action. It does. There are very, very, very important things that it does. Um, and by the way, she, she's not taking a selfie. She's actually <laughs> picking some grapes uh, in this uh, picture here. And I want to illustrate the fact that both streams really do contribute to the act of reaching out and grasping an object, but in very different ways. So the story is this. But the dorsal stream, by virtue of uh, optical physics, can, and in fact we have two eyes, 
can calculate the overall size of an object. It can get a rough idea of the overall form, the location, obviously, and the orientation with respect to the limbs. And it can do those computations quickly. Now, what it can't do, and what the ventral stream can do, is actually calculate from its visual appearance the weight, or its compliance, or its fragility, or its friction coefficients, or its temperature, or its function. In fact, it might be a tool. It can't do that it, from optical physics. It can only do it to learn associations between the appearance of the object and your interactions with that object. You learn that the grapes are squishy. Um, you learn that uh, blue flames on the stove are hot, and so on. You learn those things. And that helps you uh, in your interactions with the world. It helps you when you apply force to things or when you grab things in particular ways. So <coughs> we've been looking um, over the last few years at interactions between the two streams in the control of action. We've been doing quite a bit of work uh, looking at how we use the ventral stream to determine what a tool is and what the business end of the tool is and what the handle of the tool is and how that affects are grasping because you select a particular posture to hammer with, but then you still have to do the metrics. You still, have, even though you figured out what you, the grasp you've got to use on the basis of ventral stream perceptual cognitive stuff, you've still got to get your hand on the handle, which means that you have to do a computation about where that handle is with respect to your hand, what its orientation is, and so on and so forth. The same thing is true of material properties. We we learn a lot about the material properties of objects, not only from their shape, but also from their color and their surface features. So we know by learning, or by having been told, not many of us have actually held a gold bar, but we know that gold is heavy, and that when we reach out to pick it up, we should apply more force when we make contact with it. So. And most recently, um, we've got very interested in the fact that um, when I look out at you, some of you um, are closer here, it's closer to me than people back there, but they look roughly, you look roughly the same size. Not because uh, I'm familiar with what humans look like, although that does contribute, it could be any object. When the object's close to you, and the ob same object will move further away, it doesn't change size from your point of view, it stays the same size. We show size constancy. So how is, is that uh, actually computed? Well, lately, um, We've been trying uh, to figure this out, and I've had some fabulous uh, collaborators on this. Uh, Arenas Ferrandio, uh, who's now at uh, University of uh, East Anglia, but is about to move to Trento University in Italy. Uh, and um, most recently, Zhuang Chen, uh, who is postdoc in my lab for many years, and is now, amazingly, a full professor. She was hired as a full professor at normal um, uh, South China Normal University in Guangzhou. And she just had, two days ago, uh, a wonderful paper uh, with uh, Irene and Molly Henry, accepted for current biology, showing that uh, even though size constancy is reflected in the activity of even primary visual cortex, it takes 150 milliseconds for it to, hand, uh, to actually get set up. We used uh, high density EEG to do this. and showed that in the first 150 milliseconds, the early visual areas reflect what's on the eye, the retina, 150 milliseconds later, a bunch of top-down information uh, intrudes and then changes uh, the representation that you see uh, in the one and other areas. Um, here's another little size constancy thing. Um, those of you uh, who know them will recognize Adrian Owen and his son Jackson standing in an Ames room uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, a trip they made just before uh, Adrian got his OBE today from Prince William at Buckingham Palace. But um, Adrian clearly uh, is in real life much taller than Jackson, um, although he's not that tall. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that by distorting the shape of the room, even though because you assume it's linear uh, and square, uh, you see him as smaller than Jackson. Okay, so where does all this leave the division of labor between the dorsal and ventral streams with respect to action? Well, it rests, as I tried to indicate, not on a distinction between conscious and unconscious visual processing, but rather on a distinction between this perceptual system, seeing the world, which is indirectly linked to action via cognitive processes, and another faster, just-in-time system, 
which is directly linked to motor control. Um, and I think this is important. Both of them contribute to the programming and control of action. Because after all, you know, as a famous neuroscientist once observed, <coughs> the brain is an organ of action that's directed towards practical tasks. The brain is not there just to think and perceive and to make decisions. Because unless you act on the world, then you're not going to change it. And natural selection has nothing to operate on. So the ventral screen also has been formed by natural selection. And uh, if there are any philosophers in the audience, um, you know, this is a thoughtful as well by John Locke. I've always thought actions of men the best interpreters of their thoughts. Because thoughts, after all, are just handmaidens for action. You can do all the thinking you like, but what, you gotta, what you've got to do is get the fuck in the net. <laughs> so, that's it. I'm done. Exactly. So, um, a terrific point, and I would love to, look, to know the answer to that question. And I know <coughs> that there are comparative anatomists and, um, and neurophysiologists looking at those questions. Of course, we can't look in, we don't have a time machine, so we can't go back. All we can look at are the, uh, the lines uh, that are still here uh, with us today, uh, like monotremes and so on, like platypus and echidna, and ask the question, are their brains, first of all, assuming their brains are similar to, our, to the ancestors that were there before we split off. Um, but I'm sad to say, except for work on monkeys, um, there's very little work looking at visual motor control versus perceptual processing in these animals. So there's a lot of neuroethology that studies, you know, jumping in frogs and so on and so forth, but not very many people are looking at I mean, sexual I mean, learning. I mean, well, I mean, anatomically, yeah, well, like, so yeah, the elephants who grasp in the trunk, do they have a it mm -hmm. uh, I don't know enough about the anatomy of the elephant brain. I'd be surprised if it did not, uh, I would have to say. And I would say that's true for our highly evolved mammals in general. We certainly know for dogs and cats, uh, for rats and for mice, uh, there's evidence for uh, visual motor versus Sexual processing. It sort of stops about there, I think. Partly because, you know, in order to know whether or not an animal has, uh, can see something, you have to train it to discriminate. And the problem is a lot of amphibia 
can't learn to discriminate. So what you don't know is whether they simply have a visual motor module that uh, enables them to catch a fly, uh, or whether it involves something beyond that, because they can't tell a fly from something else. Unless it's, I mean, they can by the virtue of its movement, but they can't um, tell, the, like a, let's say, a, a fly with a white stripe on it versus a fly with a black stripe. Back. Yeah. So for to go back to the face, the hollow face. Yes. So if, if they can still see the face while reaching to it, and they did. Well, they can't. The lights go off while they're reaching. It just for. Oh, I see. For yeah. yeah. Imagine what would happen if yeah, they so could. The, does the dorsal or ventral sphere have any action on the correction to the back? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, when people do this, they are very surprised. Exactly. So what happens is you get a complete recalibration uh, of the action. So they stop and reprogram. You can do the same thing as we did in that 1986 Nature paper, where what we did was uh, people looked and pointed to a target. And during the eye movement, we jumped the target uh, to a new location further away. And they never saw the jump, ever. But they corrected at the end of their first eye movement to get them onto the target. Now. If you made the jump really large, or you did it backwards, so they went this way, even though the right was moving this way, then what would happen is they would go, oh my god, it jumped, and they would stop their hand, and there'd be a little sort of jitter in the trajectory that you're measuring. So these things, I think, uh, was, would certainly happen if you, if, if people could see the illusion, uh, and they began initially, um, sorry, they couldn't see the illusion, but then they were surprised when the hammer inside. I think there would be a, an oh my god reaction. Yeah. Oh, you had your hand out. I thought you were scratching your head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you talked about two visual systems, but I imagine you think there must be multiple systems. Sure. Well, I showed that at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because you have these different ends. Sure, yeah, so the people who have massive lesions uh, of the back of the supercortex knocking out uh, all of the input from V1 to the dorsal and the ventral stream and, uh, and much of the cerebral cortex have been tested on things like optic flow, where they'd be standing on a force plate and you've got something where this, this thing is moving up here and this is moving down here and they start showing uh, this kind of behavior, presumably through the intact accessory optic. somatosensory ones, and similarly, um, shown you get activation for haptic exploration of objects uh, in areas that are typically called, called part of the uh, visual ventral stream. Uh, I think that's, you know, the ventral stream story in haptics is really interesting because there are occasions where you use haptics by themselves, but you're often using haptics and visual together, right? So you've got something in your hand and you're exploring it and looking at it, and particularly for novel objects. Now, once you've learned the shape of an object, now I think you can rely more just on haptics. So when you reach into the bag and you try to find your lipstick, um, imagine you're doing a woman with a handbag right now, uh, then what you can do is feel the shape of the cancer. Because you've already. And so you find these um, relationships between different modalities, and, and same with audition. Uh, there's lots of auditory input into the uh, into one. We know that in, in the normal way. Yeah. Let's do the last question, and then we'll talk. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it's a kind of a related question. So yeah. if I think about the ventral stream and the dorsal stream, the ventral stream has a lot to do with experience and learning. Yeah. The dorsal stream, not so much. It's the more well, skilled learning, you have to learn to, you know, learn to ski, I think it becomes automatized. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I thought, so other differences in plasticity, is the dorsal stream less plastic than the ventral stream? Yeah. 
it's hard to know, you know what the metric is to measure plasticity, but I would argue that um, there's a lot of complex actions we do um, that are learned, uh, and they get sort of, in initial stages, they get a lot of cognitive supervision, but then I think they get handed off to structures uh, involving the posterior cortex, the cerebellum, the brain stem, the premotor cortex, and they, and they can do it on its own. So but there's also got to be a constant interaction between the ventral and the dorsal stream to control behavior. I mentioned tools, but imagine a sight-reading pianist, right, who's, who's clearly got to understand uh, what the, you know, the musical score so that all of the actions can be selected in a, in a particular way. Wonderful. Thank you, Mel.